What are the best brokers for investors in Belgium? Which ones are the cheapest? Which ones are the safest? And which ones are the most convenient to use? In this episode, we analyze and compare 10 brokers for investors in Belgium. And we cover the most common brokers such as the Giro, Bolero, Keytrade, Saxo Bank. We also talk about more newer, newer brokers such as Trade Republic or Rebel and many more. And it's, it's quite a deep dive, so it's a long episode because we really analyzed uh, according to our four criteria for selecting the best brokers, like we discussed in the previous Five Belgium Show episode. But make sure you listen to everything to have a full overview and stay to the end, because at the end, we tell you which brokers we prefer and why. And so hopefully this is going to help you understand basically what's important to look at when you're choosing a broker. And, and which one would be more suitable to your situation. As you will see, this is a fairly long episode with a lot of details about all the brokers that we're analyzing. And to make it easier for you to follow, we recommend you check the full summary table with all the criteria and the comparison that we have on the website. So it's on firebelgium.com slash brokers. You'll have access to the full table that we also present obviously in the YouTube video, but that you'll hear us talk about in the audio podcast. I'm saying us because in this episode, we have Ton, who's a special guest, who's helped me build this, this broker comparison table and has done a lot of research with me. And Ton has recently joined Fire Belgium, and I'm telling you more about it in the episode. <laughs> now, picking your broker is obviously a very important aspect of your index investing journey. It's not the only one, though. There is also simply understanding how Belgian taxes work, selecting the correct ETFs for your own situation, your asset allocation, figuring out how to actually make those trades and all the other implementation stuff that comes along with being an index investor, including building your own personal investment plan. Now, this is something that can be overwhelming if you're just getting started and it takes a long time if you want to learn on your own. But basically, I'm here to help you move forward with this and I recommend that if you're, you know, if you want to have a bit of guidance, I recommend you check the free workshop that is also on the website. It's firebundle.com slash investing workshop, where I basically explain the process of how to go from not knowing much about investing to actually having everything in place and how you can get support from me and from the team. And a new way that we provide support is that we now offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. Me and Ton, we're available to help you answer some of your questions. We're not financial advisors, but if you have questions that we can help you with, if you want to hear about our experience, or if you want to discuss your plan for financial independence, we can help you with that. So you can check that also on the website. It's firebelgium.com slash one-on-one. And with that said, let's dive into this really, 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 really interesting episode. I hope you find it useful. And if you do, please feel free to share because we've put a lot of work into this and we want this to be, we want the community and everyone to benefit from our research. It's all there available for you. Let's jump in. All right, everyone, welcome to the Fire Belgium show. And this is a very special episode, actually, today, because we have Ton on the episode as a guest. For those who don't know, Ton has been working with me now for more than a year on many aspects of Fire Belgium and some research. And for this episode on brokers, Ton has been really instrumental because it's helped me with a lot of research. So Ton, thanks for being here. It's also a special episode because it's, good. it's a live discussion. It's not going to be as edited as some of the previous episodes, maybe. And we are going to present you a working document, which is basically the current state of our research, which is quite advanced because it's the result of really three months of research. We started this actually in November, so it's more than three months, but we didn't work full time on this. But it, you know, overall, it would be probably three months of research, lots of emails to all the brokers, phone calls, a lot of reading, a lot of waiting on the phone line, answers and calling back. To get something back because you would speak to the wrong person or they wouldn't respond to emails. So anyway, a lot of time spent on this. So it's really the result of a lot of work. We also had the chance to get some help from Grigor from La Bourse, make it easy. He's, he's just shared with us his file with some research on brokers, some of which we have similar brokers for and some of which were a bit different. And there's a bit nice overlap between the, the, the research. And so we helped each other. We also provided feedback to him. And then you will see that there will be a summary of the full table of brokers with the main characteristics on the website. So you can always go and check that. You will be able to download it if you want. There will be a link for that as well. You can download the full spreadsheet so that you have a copy for yourself on your side. And yes, as this is a working document, 
things could change. There could be mistakes. That's one, because we're humans. <laughs> we're not professional financial advisors and we don't have a legal team behind us. We're doing this sort of on the side with our spare time. And also things change. Brokers update a lot of the information on a regular basis. Stuff that was available can be not available later. There can be changes in regulations. There can be changes in the structure. You name it, there's a lot of things that could happen. So, uh, you know, what we're presenting in the in the podcast episode today is what it is today. Um, and we will try to keep up the, the files and the tip summary table, so the blog post and the article, up to date as far as we can. Feel free to let us know when there's a major change that happens. Simply email us at hello at firebelgium.com because we would love to know about changes <laughs> as soon as they happen, when they're important, so we can update our data and make it useful to the entire community of index investors in Belgium. So that's uh, I think that's the main thing in terms of what you guys need to know before we start. And now, Ton, thanks again. Thanks, thanks, my friend, for helping <laughs> with this research and for all the other work that you've done so far. Behind the scenes with Fire Belgium, the research for the online course, you've delivered the course in Dutch already once, and now we're working on the next version in, in Dutch, a much more advanced and complete version of the course. So that's something that's coming and that's in the works. And some of which, obviously, the work that we're doing today for brokers will be useful, obviously, for the course as well. But so thanks for that. Appreciate it. You know, for those who don't know you, which is most people in the audience, <laughs> I guess for now, would you mind just introducing you briefly and tell us a bit about your investing experience relatively quickly so we can move into the, the brokers, of course. Okay. I started investing with physical real estate, but after that, I was also interested in investing in stocks and bonds and, and some meaning on the stock exchange. So I started with investing in, in ETFs about four years ago. And we, my wife and I invest in ETFs for ourselves and also a bit for our kids. Awesome. And you're, you're using several different brokers, right? Yeah, indeed. But more on that later. <laughs> I was wondering, you know, in the course of this research project, because really this is what it was and it's not finished. What, what, what did you find was the most difficult? For me, it was a lot of reading, reading a lot of terms and conditions to find the necessary info. So that was the first point that was difficult for me, but also calling the brokers, sending emails, waiting for feedback, waiting a lot for feedback, sometimes calling again or calling a third time. So that's, it's not always easy to get the necessary info from the brokers. Yeah, it's true. They don't know us yet, the brokers. Some of them respond really fast because they're like, ooh, these guys are big. They have 7,000 members, but some of them don't care. So yeah, we've we've had a lot of different feedback level, but in, in the end, we actually managed to get responses from most of them. So I think we can be quite happy and proud of the work we've done. And yeah, I completely agree with you. The waiting on the line and <laughs> reading the fine print in all sorts of places, it's it's heavy. And but we made it. So any, anyway, let's let's dive in. I'm gonna share my screen, and what we will do is we're going to go through each of the brokers. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sharing my screens. For those of you who are listening to the audio podcast, this means that hopefully you learn by just listening, because we're going to talk about each of the brokers one by one, covering you know all the key criteria that we believe are really important for index investors in Belgium. And you will be able to go back to the article and the file on the website. And for those of you who are watching it on YouTube, well, you'll be able to see it live. And then you can also go check the summary updated if it's been a while that we recorded this on the website, because that's going to be kept up to date, whereas obviously this recording will stay as it is. <laughs> and so we'll cover each broker one at a time. And also at the end, me and Tone will both share which broker we believe are the best for index investors or investors in Belgium. And we might have different opinion on this, but basically we'll tell you which ones we think are, are you know the best brokers to use and why. And maybe in different kinds of situations and all that. All right, let's 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 go in. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Right. So this is, the file is actually quite big. I'm going to zoom out so that people can see. All right, there's a lot of information. I'm going to zoom back in so we can actually read things on the screen. I don't really know where our cameras are going to show here, Ton, you and me, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> First time recording like this. So we'll see where it shows up, but hopefully people can see what's, what's here. Okay, so before we actually go through one of all of them we have here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten brokers right we have bolero the giro key trade saxo bank rebel from belfius bank links 
Midirect, ING, Self Invest, Trade Republic, and Maxim. And these are really the main brokers that the community has been using. And it also includes some new brokers that have popped up in the past couple of years or so. And that seem very promising that not many people are using, but could be used. Certainly. And we are going to be starting with those that are sort of the more established brokers that the community has been using for a long time. So um, we're going to start with Bolero because it's the first on our list. And for Bolero, we're going to go through each of the key criteria that we believe are really important for brokers to do right for, for them to be suitable for us as index investors. And those key criteria is something that I discussed in the in the previous episode, how to pick your broker, which you can find on the you know, on the podcast, <laughs> but also there's an article online. I'm going to share my screen to show you actually something there, right? So on the website, you can see how to pick a broker, investing for measurement 2023, and the four, the four criteria, security, access, convenience, and cost. And we explain why we believe these are the criteria. And we actually explain exactly how to, to, to assess those criteria in this article and in this podcast. And today we're going to do that for those 10 brokers all right, so let's start. We've assessed those 10 brokers and for like, for let, let's go, I would say we do a deep dive for Bolero and then for the following brokers, we sort of highlight the differences without doing everything again. So Bolero, start with security. <clears throat> do you want to, do you want to, do you want to give us an overview of what we think is important for security? Nope. You know, get started. The most important fact for security is that the funds are separated from the, the broker. So meaning the funds are stored. So your securities are stored at the custodian account. Which is, which is a different company separate from the broker. Yeah. And then as a second part regarding to security, there's also on a European level, a state guarantee on financial instruments. Yes. So these are, I would say the two levels, Yeah, as, as you mentioned. The good news is that all the brokers that we have listed here have asset segregation mandated to them. So they are implementing it. All funds are kept in custodian accounts, except for for some small exceptions, which we're going to discuss because they are all European regulated brokers. Now, as you, as you mentioned, right, separating those assets on a, on a custodian account means that the broker itself doesn't hold our investments, but they are held in separate financial institutions, banks that basically do not take any risks with those assets. So if the broker was to go bankrupt, those assets are kept in a separate entity and they cannot touch it. So even if yeah, if they go bankrupt, nobody can come and claim our asset to get reimbursement for whatever the broker messed up on. And so if that was to happen, we could simply move our assets to a new broker and continue our investment. So that's how it works. There are, however, very rare occasions where if we have bankruptcy, in addition to mismanagement of fraud, there could be losses in the assets despite this protection. It is extremely, extremely rare, right? But in the case where it happens, there is a state guarantee on financial instrument for Europe, which is a minimum of 20,000 euros. It's very small because most people will have far more than that invested. And again, we highlight it here because it's what it is, right? But as far, like, I don't know, I don't have any example of when this has been necessary, right? So examples of things like the Madoff scandal in, 20, in 2008 in the US would be the type of things where this could be used, but we this hasn't happened in Belgium. And I did some research and like the, the cases of fraud, the mismanagement, they are, well, this never happened at the level of retail investors doing investment through a, through an investment broker like this. There's been issues with specific individuals, employees in specific entities that were doing stuff that was super shady, but it's never impacted retail investors. And I also asked the government or the, the authority that's responsible for this. And they said that in 2021, the fund that provides guarantee wasn't used. And I've asked them the question to see if in previous years it had been used or not to get an idea, but I don't have the answer yet. If I do have it by the time we actually publish this or write the article, it'll be there. But it seems like it's basically, it's not something that's been used, right? This 20,000 state guarantee on financial instruments. And the main protection we have is custodians and the, the assets being kept in custodians. Okay, so it's a quick interruption here. I've actually received a response from the Protection Fund since we recorded the main episode. And I just want to tell you that they've responded saying that the Protection Fund has not been used since 1999. So there has not been any case where it was necessary to go and get those protection funds to cover some of the losses of assets of investors, which means the asset segregation is working as intended for all Obviously, all, all the investment platforms that are 
based and regulated in Belgium. Right, that was just a quick update. Let's carry on. Now, I also wanted to read here something that's important that comes from the Guarantee Protection Funds, the website itself, where they explain this again. And I want to highlight it because it's important. <laughs> so what they say on their website. It is important to draw attention to the important legal protection a client benefits for the securities he has entrusted to his financial institution. Indeed, the customer remains the legitimate owner of his titles and has a right of direct claim to them. This means that the securities must be returned by the curator and therefore can never fall into the bulk of the assets of a possible bankruptcy. Right? An intervention on the part of the protection system, which is this protection fund, should only be considered if after return of available securities, customers would not have been able to recover some of their assets. Such cases should only occur in the event of administrative error or other irregularities, which is mismanagement and fraud, as I was saying, which again, we don't have you know examples of in Belgium. Right. So I wanted to highlight that and clarify it. It's the reason I'm clarifying this and we spoke about it in the previous episode, is because it's the most important aspect of investing is that we don't lose the money that we put in those investments, that it doesn't disappear because of bankruptcy or mismanagement or fraud. And so we want to know exactly what are the risks there and we want to minimize them as far as, as much as possible, right? So that's that's the main thing. Now we have other elements in security, Tony. You want to cover those? Yeah, so for each broker, we also added the regulator. So that meaning that's the government that uh, looking at the back, looking at the broker, that everything went well, that they don't break the law, for example. And for every broker, that could be another instance. They do the audits as well, right? Yeah, indeed. And then also the account security. So it's important that when you open an account on the web or via an app, that it's well secured and that nobody can break in in your account. And last item is the security lending so that, for example, a broker can give you the possibility or not to lend out your security. And may, most of the times it's lent it out the securities to shorters. Right. And we added this into security because there is a case where it can add risks to at that level, you know. So that's why we added that in, in this section. I think, you know, in account security, we do mention the ways the, the, the technologies that are available for us to log in to our accounts. Obviously, the key here is to prevent a third party from accessing our account and trying to make transactions and maybe taking money out, which is, even if they actually do that, it's hard because normally it's linked to our one of our accounts in our personal name. But, you know, some there's probably professional hackers trying to do this. So having the highest level of security in terms of access is important. And it's really not just a two-step or two-factor system like we've listed here, but it's also you know, a complex password, right? If you have passwords involved, let, make sure they are complex with lots of different complicated, you know, different types of, of characters and quite long because then it makes them much harder to simply you know, force break, right? And that is something that is true for anything that you do online when you have passwords, but it's especially true for things where you have most of your financial assets because <laughs> that's what would hurt you the most potentially. Right. So for Bolero, let's go back to Bolero. They have their funds in a custodian account. So it's asset segregation. Yes, is implemented. It's normal. It's the case for actually all of the brokers we have. It's regulated by the FSMA in Belgium. It has a state guarantee of financial instruments up to 20,000 euros, of 20,000 euros. And it has good account security, DigiPass, It's Me, uh, an encrypted app, and face recognition. There's different variations of this and combination. Basically, it's it's pretty good. And it does not lend securities. So Bolero tends, seems from our perspective to be extremely safe from based on those criteria and our research. Yeah, any, any other comments on security? No. All right. No so, so let's go to access. I'll cover this quickly. Ton, basically, when it's simple, I'll cover it. <laughs> yeah. So access, it's simple. We have it there because it makes no sense to have a broker that doesn't give us access to what we need. And essentially, we want access. We want it to be accessible to in Belgian residents because it's via Belgium and we're serving Belgian investors or Belgian-based investors and pref access to preferred markets. So that's the stock market where we trade or where we buy and sell the index funds, the ETF specifically, and again, specific access to the preferred ETF. So the list of ETFs that we find are the best. And obviously we want to pick a broker that gives us access to what we want to invest in. All right. So to keep it super simple, most brokers give us access to everything that we need. There's a few exceptions, which we will discuss when, when we get there. You want to you wanna talk about convenience? Yeah. So convenience is mainly related to taxes. So when you're a Belgian resident and pay your taxes in Belgium, when you're buying and selling ETFs, there are a lot of taxes that come in. So 
The first one is TOB, so that's the tax on stock exchanges. So when you buy an ETF, you have to pay a little tax, a little percentage of tax, but all, also when you sell an ETF. The second one is dividends. We try to avoid dividends via our selection of ETFs. It's one of the selection criteria to buy accumulating ETFs. But if you have to pay dividends, that's also one criteria. And then the bond ETF capital gain, it's called the Reinders tax. This uh, capital gains tax is always to be paid when you, when you are selling bonds. And that's also a criteria. So the tax reporting is three, threefold TOB, the dividends and the bond ETF capital gains. And then for some brokers, the foreign brokers, you also have to register them at the National Bank of Belgium. Right. And so basically what we like for brokers to do is to deal with all of this for us. So we don't have to deal with it. And this is for two reasons. One is because it's convenient and comfortable. And two, it's because when it's not done by the, by the broker, it can lead to either we forget because it has happened to me, <laughs> I forgot. To, I didn't know at first, right? So there's a lot of people investing with non-Belgian brokers that actually don't declare those taxes. And when you don't declare it on time or you don't do it properly, it leads to penalties, especially for the tax on transaction, the TOB. And so it, it's really convenient and that the broker does it. And if it doesn't, it's extremely important that the investor does it properly. Now, practically, are they going to fine you? That's uncertain because you know how much they enforce the actual rule is something different but certainly we don't want to be we'd want to be on the correct side of the law we don't want to be liable for high fees and penalties and again as i said in the previous episode i know an investor who had to pay 70,000 euros of penalties on a you know an account an investment account of about 50,000 euros and that was after investing for just 2 3 years so it it racks up really fast we don't want to go there all right so bolero does all of that for us so bolero is very easy open the account we do the transaction we don't have to declare anything we don't have to make extra transaction bolero does the payment and declare it to the tax authorities for us and that's quite amazing there's no need to register anything with the national bank of belgium bolero for that is quite good right so, so far, yes. good for security, good for access, good for convenience. Now, the fourth category of criteria is costs. Do you want to run as well here? Do you want to give an overview of what's going on here? So, yeah, for, for ETF investors, the two most important costs are ongoing fees. Does the broker charge you an ongoing fee? So, an, an, a fee that you always have to pay for managing your account. And then there are transaction fees. And for transaction fees, we mainly look at the transactions fees if you make an make a transaction on the Amsterdam exchange or the Frankfurt exchange. Yeah. <clears throat> and we've listed basically in the file here all those fees. In most cases, there's no ongoing fee for any broker, but there's one broker where there are. And so we made sure that we highlight that. And then there is transaction fees for all of them, obviously, on those two stock exchanges, some of them very low, but some of them regular ones. And what we've done as well is we've made we've made two scenarios where we have an individual investors making contributions and transactions or investments of a certain amount every month or so every quarter. And we have we have basically four scenarios, right? We have one where the investor is investing 250 euro in IWDA, which is one of the one of the preferred ETFs in the community each month, right? So this is monthly investment of 250 euros. The second scenario is when we do one investment every quarter of 2,500 euros in IWD as well. And here the idea is basically to not pay this transaction fee, the fixed part every month. We pool our investments each month and we invest once every quarter, right? That's completely fine to do. And it reduces transaction costs. Now what you do here as well is means that your money is not invested as soon as you have it. Right? So you could be missing on some gains, but we don't know whether it would be going up or going down. On average, it goes up, but not always. So a lot of investors simply like to reduce what they can control. And in this case, it's transaction fee. And so pulling your, your contributions together, making fewer transactions throughout the year is one way of doing that. I wouldn't go beyond like four to six months of pulling money together. I think every quarter is, is a good balance if you want to save on fixed costs right there's also a there's also a percentage cost based on the size of the transaction and also if it's if it's only a percentage cost that you're looking at in some cases that's the case or if it's for example tax on transaction these are percentage based it doesn't matter right this is mostly for the fixed costs and we've picked 2500 euros because there's a several brokers for which that is kind of well especially bolero but that's the limit from which you move into a different bracket of cost 
And so pulling money up to, you know, to be sure, 2,499 euros and making a transaction there for, for seven, seven and a half euros from Sudan, for example, or 15 euros in Frankfurt um, is a way of basically optimizing how much you're paying for that transaction money. And so we have the same two scenarios with VWCE because VWCE is traded on Frankfurt Stock Exchange and the costs are usually different, sometimes higher. And so that way we have a better idea of what is sort of the rough transaction costs excluding tax on transaction, but the brokerage costs for each of those scenarios. And we can then compare them. And for Bolero, let's go for those who are on the audio side of things. Bolero tends to have good fees. They're not the cheapest. They're not the most expensive. They're kind of right in the middle. Um, it's seven and a half euros on Amsterdam stock exchange up to 2,500. And then it goes up as you increase your amounts. I'm not going to go into all the details because most people make contributions of less than 2,500 euros. And for Frankfurt, it would be 15 euros per tranches of 2,500. And then it goes up with, you know, basically higher amounts, it would be more expensive, but it kind of follows this, it's sort of proportional, right? It's just that they keep it simple for small amounts is seven and a half and 15, and that's it. Which means that for someone investing four times a year in IWDA, for example, once a quarter, right? It would be 30 euros through Amsterdam. And 60 euros if it was done on in Frankfurt, for example, buying VWC. And then it would be, it should be four times that if we invest once a month instead of once a quarter. No, 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 it's three times that. So it would be 90 euro if we invest once a month in IWDA uh, through Amsterdam. And it would be 180 euros. So 12 times 15 euros if we invest once a month in VWCE through Frankfurt Stock Exchange, right? So the, um, the average... I would say we are between like 30 euros for the lowest at the lowest level and up to close to 200 if we invest in VWC monthly. But most people should be able to reduce those costs to the lower numbers that we're mentioning here. So basically, there is kind of right in the middle. And this is a nice example of how to reduce your cost. You can um, reduce the number of transactions or invest in a bit of a different stock exchange. So picking different ETFs is one way of doing that as well. Did I miss anything on, on costs here, Ton? No. Totally clear. Yeah. We actually have more notes, obviously, that are at the bottom here for each of the broker. I think it'd be good to cover them as well. This will not be shown on the website, but they will be available on the spreadsheet that you can download. So we've listed the contact details of the brokers and whether they were responsive to, to responsive to us during the research. So we have the contact brokers, the contact details for Bolero, and they were quite responsive. Bolero tends to actually they're quite fast, whether it's phone or or via email message. And then we also provide information on the type of accounts that they provide. And we have here individual account, joint accounts, and company accounts. So if you're investing through your company, if you're self-employed, for example, provides that. What else do we want to share? So for the security part, we also have extra information regarding the custodian. So the most important part of security and also ask the brokers, which custodian parties, mainly banks or other institutions, all the securities are stored. And then we also ask the, the credit rating of those custodians, just to be sure that you can, that you can see that it's safe, very safe or less safe. Yeah. And for Bolero, they didn't tell us exactly what the custodians were, but they're saying that they were qualitative. And we assume that they use KBC Bank and maybe some other ones. And KBC Bank has a rating, credit rating from Standard & Poor of A+, which is probably the highest rating we've seen so far in all the ratings that we've looked at for custodians. So it's, if, if, they held, if they hold the assets in KBC Bank, which is kind of connected to Bolero, but Bolero could go bankrupt without KBC Bank going bankrupt. And that's... Likely, you know, if Bolero goes bankrupt, KBC Bank will be fine. <laughs> but if KBC Bank goes bankrupt, then Bolero might be infected too. So, but KBC Bank is extremely safe. A plus, some of the highest one. And we don't know about the other students they're using. So we don't know about the credit rating, but likely to be high as we've seen for most of the brokers anyway, right? And then we also asked other questions. We wanted to know basically if the brokers had other ways of making money. And the reason why we ask this question is because we want the brokers to serve us, the investors. And there are obviously other ways brokers can make money and basically want to figure out whether they're doing that. There's been a lot of controversy around payment for order flow in the US because some very low cost or even free transaction brokers were making money through order flow and that had negative or potentially negative impact on the performance for the, the customers or the investors, which means that basically 
customers and investors were sort of the product because then the data and the order flow was sold to specific entities and the brokers was making money like that. So, so it's basically, it's been an important question in the US. And so we want to check that here and see what's going on in, in, in Europe, in Belgium. And also we wanted to know whether there was kickback from product providers such as ETF issuers, because we know of one broker who does it. And we're not sure whether that leads to any kind of conflict of interest or whether there's a, you know, misaligned incentives, but basically want to highlight that as well when we can. And so that's what we did. And so for Bolero, no payment for order flow, no kickback from product providers. So Bolero really only makes money from transactions. It seems to make sense. And then we also did an extra calculation on costs for people who are basically investing very large sums. We just wanted to have an idea of whether, like which broker would be good for people making very large transactions. So people who have several hundred thousands of euros and they're comfortable making transactions of such size in one go, which is very rare, but they are. And so Football Ever, for example, a transaction of 200,000 euro into IWDA would be 245 euros. And for VWC would be 300 euros. It's actually very, very small compared to the size of the transaction. So it's extremely cheap generally. Uh, and we see that some other brokers would be cheaper and some of the brokers will be more expensive, but generally it's still a fairly small amount of the total. So overview for Bolero, Tuan, you want to give an overview of what we think of them? It's secure, for me, it's a secure broker because there is a big bank in Belgium, KBC behind it, which has a good reputation and all the other tick boxes tick well in green. The cost, there are costs for mainly for the cost for transactions but you pay what you get. So you get good service, secure broker, but you also pay a cost per transaction. That's not that high, but also not that low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree with you. Generally, a good broker, middle of the pack in terms of cost, but on everything else, sort of, um, you know, ticking all the boxes that we want. Okay. Let's talk about the, um, the broker that's been most used by the Fire Belgium community historically, and that is the Giro. Yeah, so the Giro is a Dutch broker and it's taken over by a German bank, Flatex, or Flatex de Giro. They renamed it to Flatex de Giro. So the regulators are in the Netherlands, the AFM and Bafin in Germany. So that's a, a difference because, because it is a foreign broker. Then the state guarantee is a little bit different. There's also a maximum of 20,000 euros when something goes wrong. Not the bankruptcy, but even when there is fraud, for example. It's only, they only cover 90% of your securities with a maximum of 20,000 euros. And then the account security itself, there is a login and a password as a basic security. And you can choose for an opt-in with a two a step or two factor system. Yeah. So that's the last... something people should do, right? So here we kind of give it a green tick because we expect most people to actually enable a more secure account login. But if you have a Azure account, don't just keep login and password. Please add two factor to step security as well. It's good. Indeed. And then the last point, the security lending. So for new customers, you have no choice. Then you take a basic account. But for example, customers that they ask or they opened their account a couple of years ago, because I think the change was last year. They also had the option to take a, a custody account. And with a custody account, you pay a little bit more costs, but you have the choice to not lend out your securities. But for now, everyone, the new customers have no choice. So your securities can be lended up. And the disadvantage is that you cannot see this in your account. So you have no view on that your securities are lended out or not. Yeah. And what's the, what's the consequence of having securities lent out? In some cases, it could increase the risk exposure for very little gains or benefits. Yeah. Usually when lending securities, brokers will be making a small profit on, on that. And in some cases, it's shared with the investor. In some cases, it's not. Sometimes it's fully given to the investor. Sometimes it's yeah, shared anyway. So while security lending is common, is a common and generally safe practice in the fund management industry, mostly ETFs allow security. Most ETFs actually do security lending. This is not the case for brokers. It's generally safer to pick a broker that does not lend your assets. This is our, this is my position, actually, our position, because it's an extra risk we don't need to take because it, takes, it gives us very little gain. Actually, as index investors, if we want to make a little bit more money and take risk, we do that in the area where we actually understand, which is asset allocation. We increase our allocation towards stocks. And that's how we take more risks. 
increase our risk exposure. And that's how we can also increase our expected returns, you know, up to a certain point. And again, generally. So so as it like security lending doesn't isn't exactly the tool we use to take more risk and reward. And it's risk that we don't fully understand. And in the specific case of the Giro, for example, this is obviously something that came from Tone's research. For example, if you open an account with Dutch broker De Giro as a retail investor basic account, you agree that your investment can be lent out. And we don't have a choice anymore for new investors going to De Giro. There is only the basic account available. The other one is not available. So you cannot opt out of the security lending program. Whereas most brokers who actually does do have a security lending program will give you the choice and it's an opt-in. You're not opted in by default. You actually have to choose to get in, not with the Giro. It's just mandatory. And you cannot check in your brokerage account whether your investments have been lent out or not, right? If you ask them, it seems that they might tell you, but Tone asked them and <laughs> they told you, Tone, that your assets were not being lent, but it could change in the future. Actually, right, it, this will change in the future, right? <laughs> they mean, so we don't, we don't know. It seems like if we ask, they might tell us. And with security lending, the investments are not held by the custodian because they are lent out to another investor. But the custodian has an obligation to the zero and so to the investor. This can lead to additional risks and we can, anyway, you have access here on the article to the terms and conditions of the zero. So to be completely honest, I don't fully understand all of this, right? Because it's beyond my, my 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 general knowledge. But what I do understand is that if it's not with the custodian, it's on the Giro's balance sheet most likely. And if that's the case and something happens to the Giro and there's mismanagement fraud or whatever, all sorts of issues going at the same time. And if your assets are lent out, I'm not as certain that those assets are as safe as if they were simply with the custodian without being lent out. Tom, what's, what's your perspective on this? Yep, indeed, I agree. There is only one extra remark that I can give is that the Giro says or shows to the investor that they ask a collateral from the from the lender. But indeed, when something goes wrong with bank with with the Giro, like a bankruptcy or, or other reason, it's not secure anymore because it's the collateral is also going away. Yeah. So I think they explain this in the email that they sent you, right? They say for this to go wrong, it would have to be the Giro goes bankrupt at the same time as the lender is not able to pay back. But since there is collateral, what you, we would lose as retail investor would be the difference between the collateral provided and the actual value of the investments. So because the collateral would be used to reimburse us. If the if the investment was actually worth more, it would be that's that's the value we would lose. So that is if everything works as intended right but we can see that there's several levels of um, you know complication that I don't, we don't basically we don't need that as index investors basically the likelihood of anything wrong happening here is extremely low right because obviously this is heavily controlled it's not something they do because they want but it's a piece of it's an element in the structure that we don't need and they do it because it provides additional returns and that's also what allows brokers such as the zero to offer low costs so it's a bit of a give and take, right? You can, we'll talk about costs and the fees and they're very, very low and very interesting. But there's also this counterparty, which this, this, this other part of the coin, which is, well, you know, they make money in a different ways. So it's good to be aware of that. And I think finally, since we're talking about safety, I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet. And, and we've spoken about the regulators. We know that the Giro has had issues with the Dutch regulator in the past. And also with the German regulator, they've been flagged for a few things. Now, again, usually this means that they fix those problems, right? So it's a good thing they were found out. But we haven't heard of such, you know, issue with other brokers. So other brokers don't don't seem to have such big issues as the Giro does with the regulators. So generally, the Giro seems to have this reputation of not not the reputation, but they've had issues with the regulators, right? So this is another point. It's good to know. Um, when they have issues, it gets fixed and they move on. Otherwise, the regulator follows up. And, you know, obviously there can be consequences for the Giro, but it's not a positive sign either, right? So again, the Giro is very interesting, very low fee, lots of people use it. It's good to be aware of this other side of the coin. Let's go and talk about convenience. Yeah. So there's also a difference regarding tax reporting, and we mainly discuss ETFs tax reporting here. So the TOB, so the tax on transactions for each transaction is withheld by the Giro. So that's already a good thing but not for ETF dividends and also not for bond capital gains. They will provide a document, including the dividends and the coupons that are paid that year, 
But as far as we see, there is no overview of the capital gains. So meaning that capital gains need to be calculated manually. And as it's a foreign broker, you also have to register this on the National Bank of Belgium. That's the first part. But also on, on your yearly tax form. At the end of your yearly tax form, you also have to note all your foreign accounts. So for the Giro, you have to note the, the Giro account and also the Flatex Bank account. So you need to note twice. Yes, those two, they have to be mm -hmm. both registered with the National Bank of Belgium and both of them need to be declared in the individual tax report. Yeah, but the National Bank of Belgium, it's only once when you open an account and also if you close it when you close it. But the tax form, it's a yearly, you need to, to mention. Mm -hmm. So generally, the Giro takes care of the most annoying of all of these tax complications, which is tax and transaction, but then doesn't on a few other, right? And I think it basically adds a little bit of worry and potential work if you do sell bonds with the capital gains, which, you know, most index investors would likely do in the future at some point. So this is kind of an annoying thing. Dividend, you know, that's not a big issue because most of us just simply don't have dividend distributing ETFs, but the other two points are, are quite annoying, can be quite annoying. So it's keep it's good to keep that in mind, make sure you actually comply with those things if you have a zero account. But otherwise, again, the main thing is that you'll be and that's taken care of, so that's pretty good. Okay, let's take a look at the costs again. So no ongoing fees, so no monthly fees for the account at the Giro. One of the advantages are the transaction fees, the low transaction fees. So the Giro has an ETF core selection list and all the ETFs that are on this list are free to buy without transaction costs at minimum one once per month. So the first transaction is always free. And there are some, there are some rules, for example, for the second and third transaction. The second transaction needs to be higher than 1,000 euros. The transaction, total transaction amount needs to, be, needs to be higher than 1,000 euros and in the same direction. Meaning if you buy the first, the first order is a buy order, then the second order also and the third, for example, also needs to be a buy order. So buy, buy, for example, or sell, sell, but not buy, sell or sell, buy, for example. If yes. you buy an ETF outside the core selection, then you pay two euros per transaction. And for each, and that's new, for each of the transactions, you pay one euro of handling fee. So also for the ETFs on the core selections, you will pay one euro of handling fee. And this is starting from the 15th of May of this year, or is it already implemented? It's only from the 15th of May, 2023. Right. So they're, they are introducing now a new fee schedule, and this is the new fee, which means that the minimum cost per transaction is now one euro handling fee and it will be applied to the core selection which used to be free right yeah indeed all, all of that to say that these are really really small fees right so even if it's one euro instead of zero before this is still extremely cheap and even if the etf is outside of the core selection it's two euro per transaction plus one so three basically very very low cost compared to most other brokers and then we have this trade gate thing can you tell us a bit, about, a bit more about that that's a kind of solution that they propose. It's a, a kind of different market where you can also buy and sell outside the, the stock market hours. And then you pay three euro 90 cents per transaction. Okay. Is this something that we want to be using? I don't think so because it's also outside the, the official markets of, for example, Euronext next Amsterdam or, or Frankfurt, but we cannot guarantee or. I think they cannot guarantee the liquidity and also the the bid ask spreads, uh, so the the spreads of the of of each of each ETF on on each on each market. So it's not okay. advised to use them. Yeah, usually we don't we don't. Yeah, it's more expensive. That's that's already a good reason not to use them. But then they're you know it basically works differently than what we know in terms of how to trade on the stock market. And usually we buy and sell during. Obviously, trading hours on those stock markets that we know. One last remark regarding the core selection. For now, the IWDA and the VWCE are on that list. But be aware that this list can change every time. So they changed this list in the last years a couple of times. So and what I understood is that they may change it also with when on introducing the new tariffs on May 15. So be aware and check this list before you place an order. Mm -hmm. Because it could simply mean that 
the transaction costs two euro more than you expect if it's not on the core selection lists and if it was before. Okay, so this might be changing on the 15th of May, 2023, and it could change at any point in time in the future. So it's good to check it. All right, awesome. And we we did the same cost estimate for the four scenarios that we discussed earlier. And the euro is just very, very low, right? Because we're talking about, you know, one to three euro per transaction. So that would be like, you know, at the lowest four to 12 euros of annual cost for those transactions if you if you buy four times a year, so once a quarter. And and it would be three times more, so 12 to 36 euros if you buy once a month. So it's very low. And, uh, you know, with using the previous fee schedule and using core selection, it would be zero, right? But it looks like being able to make free transactions on the Jura would not be possible anymore because of the handling fee. So the minimum would be one euro per transaction. So like, you know, 12 per year if it's once a month or four per year if it's once every quarter. Extremely cheap. It's the cheapest or second cheapest of the entire list we have. Okay, so let's let's see what we have as extra notes for the Giro. We have included the contact details here. Responsiveness during the broker research was was good, right? Tony, you were in contact with them either by phone and and also by email. They answered well detailed on the phone and also via email. Mm -hmm. Then we have individual and joint accounts, no company accounts, it seems. They keep their the investment in custodian banks, and they've given the names of five custodian banks. And we have the credit rating for each of those. So Morgan Stanley, A minus, A, A, so say is A plus, and Flatex Digital Bank themselves, A minus. So they're all very good, which, you know, is as expected, <laughs> thankfully. And then do they have other sources of income, payment for the flow? No. Kickback from product providers? No. Remember though, they do do security lending. So that is a yes, and they do get payment for that. And then uh, I didn't do the math for how much it would cost to make a massive transaction of 200,000 euros because I don't know if there's a maximum in you know, max max they, they don't seem to mention that there's a maximum amount for which you know these core selection transactions are zero or one euro per transaction so I'm guessing it would be you know one euro <laughs> if we buy IWDA with 200,000 euros but I, I don't know and so I just left it blank is there anything else we want to say about the zero on this no nothing to add Low cost, but yeah, that's the most important point that they advertise, that they are very low cost. But sometimes uh, when it's very low or free, then sometimes you are a bit the product, like security lending, for example, like yeah. regulators, remarks, etc. Plus, if they don't, like something that I'm, I think about is like, if they don't make much money as a business, then they have to rely on other ways to basically run. So that could be, you know, they have less money to run the business or they have to work with loans or investors and there's so it just potentially puts more financial pressure on the entity itself to actually run properly and maybe that's what leads to problems with the regulators i don't know right obviously there's a lot we don't know about how brokers function internally and whether it's all working fine and they just have a few small issues or if it's a total mess and the regulators just mo noticed a couple of them and then you know and sort of highlighted them i've worked in different companies in my <laughs> career past and i've seen different ways of working some completely messy with all sorts of shady stuff going on and some completely clean and working really well but yeah clearly the one that was financially struggling was doing shady stuff and the one that was doing well financially because it was charging higher prices was completely clean and working really nicely inside so anyway I don't know, right? Again, there's so much we don't know about those brokers. Certainly, the Jura is interesting for people who are investing very small amounts on a regular basis. And that's what's been attracting those low fees. Are, that's what's most attractive. It's just good to be aware of the other aspects of this. And since, you know, we value security a lot and we value convenience a lot for the tax stuff, we've highlighted that here. Let's move on. We've done two out of 10 and we've been speaking for quite a while. I'm thinking the next ones will be a bit faster because now we've kind of covered a lot of stuff. Okay. So key trades regarding security, all things are fine. Regulated by FSMA in Belgium. They have a state guarantee of 70,000 euros because they are subsidiary of a French institution, a French bank. And in France, it's, it's 70,000 euros state guarantee. Good security, DigiPass, the app is encrypted and no security lending. So that's all, all good. For access, it is the same. So uh, as Belgian resident, you can open an account. They offer Amsterdam and Frankfurt markets and preferred ETFs that we want. Convenience, all good, is the Belgian broker. So they do all the taxes for us. So that's very good news. And then regarding costs, non-ongoing fee, but a bit higher transaction fees, starting from about 15 euros 
on Amsterdam and 25 on Frankfurt. So this means that it's interesting when you invest large amounts. That's the main point here for key trades regarding the costs. Yeah. So key trade, the way I look at it usually is key trade is just like Bolero in most cases. One difference is this, you know, fund, the state guarantee and financial instrument, which is higher, but this is something that we never use anyway. But it could, like, if for people who are really, really, really focused on security, that might be something they want to consider, even though it's extremely unlikely to ever be used. But the way I look at this is like they basically double the price of Bolero. Right, more or less like seven and a half, and then it's 15, and then 15 it becomes 25 for Frankfurt. And we see that as well in the scenarios that we've run, it's about twice as expensive or a bit less, no, but they're more expensive than Bolero and they're about the same in terms of other aspects. Now, let's look at our notes for them. We have the contact details. Ah, yeah, they did not respond to any of our inquiries. <laughs> Basically, it looks like their customer service is sleeping, so I've been calling them, emailing them, all sorts of ways to different email addresses, nothing. I think it was on Twitter. I kind of messaged them all over the place and I got zero, nothing back. So I don't know. I don't know. don't know what's going on. Maybe you need to be a customer to get any kind of response. I haven't, I don't have an account with them, so I haven't tried. But yeah, so not very good there. And they have kids accounts. So that's probably one big difference and one element that might be interesting for people who want to invest for their kids. Tony, you want to talk about this a bit? So it is possible for a minor, so kids, to open an account. It's even an investing account, so not only a bank account, but also an investing account. But be aware, when you open a kid's account, the money is really for the kids, meaning that it is designed for them. So it is not possible to get or to withdraw money from the kid's account without the approval of the kid itself. But if it's a minor, you... In theory, you have to go to court to ask to ask the, the to or withdraw the money from a kid's account because it is designed for the kids itself. Yeah, so it does protect the the kid yeah. really to, to the to, to how it should be, which is which is what is designed to be. So that's pretty good. Is it open? Is is it open? You can open an account like an an other key trade account because uh, it's a checking account and an investment account together. So it is. Okay. The same pro- it seems the same procedure as a, as an adult account as a yeah. normal account. Yeah, it probably just just needs an adult connected to the account as well to handle it with the kid or something. Okay, and we don't have information on their custodians because they didn't respond to our requests and we couldn't find it in the website. And we don't know about other sources of income. M- most likely, they don't have this because they're a bank and they don't need this kind of income. They make money from other stuff. So I would expect that to be no here, and I would expect credit rating of the custodian to be pretty good because it's a bank again so they're probably partnering with very solid custodians so i wouldn't be worried about these things essentially and then on the cost for large transactions yeah they're actually cheaper than bolero so there are double the costs for small transactions compared to bolero but they are cheaper or like you know less than half or even a third of the cost for large transactions so if you're making very large transactions this might key trade might be more interesting than bolero so overall key trade good Costs are, we put them we put them a yellow mark because they're double the price of Bolero, but otherwise everything else is pretty solid. I wish they answered <laughs> the emails and phones, but, you know, people using Keytrade as, as investment broker have been very happy, apart from the communication aspect, but they're very, very, very happy otherwise. So a solid, solid entity, certainly, solid broker. Let's move to Saxo Bank, yeah? Yeah. So Saxo Bank in Belgium actually... It was formerly known as Bank. So up till 2019, I think, or 2020, they were Bing Bank and they've been operating in Belgium. I think initially they were Dutch. And so they also have Dutch branches, but they were operating in, in Belgium for a long time. And they were one of the most common investment brokers as well for the community. And they've been acquired by Saxo Bank. Saxo Bank, which is a very large broker group, you know, around the world. Yes. So for security, the main, I, I would call it disadvantage is that the, aside the login and password, the, there is uh, only a two-step authentication or two-factor authentication by SMS. So you can log in in your account with login and password to, to view your, your balance, for example. But once you want to make a transaction, you they send an SMS to your phone. Yeah, and this is something that I, and you know, from my understanding of security and risk management, this is not the best because 
text messages can be intercepted. And they don't seem to have, you know, basically a proper two-step factor or two-factor system that's better than the text message one. Um, and then there's an option for face recognition, which is not automatic and it's only on the app. So anyway, yeah, Saxo Bank seems like on, on the login safety side of things is not the best. Security lending, it's optional. So it's not there by default, so it's fine. I think if, if you do select yes, then just know what it means. Most people don't need it. So generally, yeah, security, good apart from actual access to the account. Okay, maybe I can continue a little bit because here, basically, when it was Bing Bank, we had no access problem because they had access to everything that we needed, the markets and ETFs. And with Sanxo Bank joined in 2020 or took, like took, took them over, certain ETFs were not available for a while because of the key investor information document at the time it was called. It was not available for some ETFs because of that change of ownership and then they were available again and then now again we have issues with some kid not being there because there's been an update in the european regulation and saxo bank is kind of shuffling things around and removing etfs that they don't have all the documents for and we don't know exactly what's going on but sometimes etfs are available those that we want sometimes they're not and most of the time it's just because of documentation availability and so this could be basically if you're investing with saxo bank it could be that you're able to buy a specific ETF for a certain time and at some point it's not available anymore because that happened. But then there's a like, very likely, it's very likely that it will be become available again. It's just a matter of time. And so if you're investing with them, simply contact them as a customer and say, hey, I need this ETF. Please give me the document. And in most cases, they will bring it back, especially if it's a list if it's if it's an ETF that, for example, one of the ETFs that we talk about in the index investing course, usually they will be available. But it's anyway, it's been a bit of a struggle <laughs> for some people there, and it's a bit annoying. So that that gives it. That's why we have a yellow a yellow mark here instead of green. But otherwise, you know, they've been they've been okay. And another quick update: <laughs> Saxo Bank have actually emailed all their users saying that all the key are now been restored and so all the ETFs are available. So. It looks like at the time of the release of this episode, all ETFs that we usually like to invest in are available with Saxo Bank. So convenience, all good. They do all the taxes for Belgium. So there's nothing to do. They're based here. They do everything like Bolero and Key Trade. So we move on. And in terms of costs, they're basically between Bolero and Key Trade, more or less. <clears throat> That's 10 euro up to 5,000 euro transaction on both Amsterdam and Frankfurt. So they're basically a bit more expensive on Amsterdam side of things and a bit cheaper on Frankfurt compared to Bolero. So if you're investing in VWC, for example, which is traded on Frankfurt Stock Exchange, it's a bit cheaper with Saxo than it is with Bolero. And it's obviously much cheaper than key trade still. So Saxo Bank, similar price to Bolero, very similar to Bolero in general, apart from this access to specific ETFs, which kind of has is, is been messy a bit, and actual security of accessing your investment account. I have a test account with Saxo Bank and I have a test account with Bolero. And I have to say also that from a user perspective, user friendliness, Bolero was nicer. As well. So that's also based on personal, just using the platform and trying to figure out things. Saxo Bank was more confusing. <laughs> that was already, already the case with Bing Bank. It was more confusing than Bolero. So I think it, it's a bit cheaper if for VWC, I would say, but there's like a few things that make it a little bit not as nice as Bolero. But otherwise, solid platform. What else do I have to say about this? Yeah, we will go through the comments, but there's one more thing I wanted to say about ongoing costs. I have experience also with Saxo Bank before the acquired Bing Bank when I was investing from abroad and I started investing with them in 2012 or 2013. And at the time they were also low cost and they were available very good. They had access to everything and they had only this fixed transaction fee, but then they, they included an ongoing fee, custody fee of 0 0.24 per year or something like this. And that made me move away from them to another broker. And I don't know if they are have plans on doing that for Belgium, but I would say I wouldn't be surprised if they bring that as well into Belgium because they seem to be doing this in a lot of international markets for them. So we'll see, right? So just keep an eye on that. If you're an, an investor at Saxo Bank, just keep an eye on the custody fee. You might get emails that they announced that they've been introducing those. Just keep an eye on it. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but they have it in, you know, in some other countries. So they might also bring it here if it makes sense for them. But otherwise, solid bank and solid broker. In the con in the details, yeah, we have contact details. They had good communication. They responded, I think, the, the next day with all the details we asked. That was really good. They have the usual type of accounts available. And the student banks are Citigroup and ABN. And for ABN, we know it's A as 
credit rating. And then for, for Citigroup, what was it? It was complicated, no? <laughs> I remember you, you... It's a very long document, a very long this... document with a lot of ratings. So it's not easy to de determine one rating for the for Citigroup. Yeah, somehow we managed to get single ratings for some of these banks. And then for Citigroup, it's just, we couldn't figure it out which one what, <laughs> which one it was. But it looked good, no? And generally, Citigroup is, is, is safe. So I'm expecting that to be a good, a good rating as well. And then sources of income, they don't have anything else. They don't do, they don't do, where is it? Security lending? Actually, yes, but only available as optional, optionally available. And they don't get payment for the flow kickback from product providers. And then in terms of costs for very large transactions, um, they are on par with key trade. So they're actually cheap if you're looking to make a very large contribution to a single ETF. So 99 euro, so even a little bit cheaper than key trade. Yeah. And do you have experience with Saxo Bank? Yes, I am a customer of Saxo Bank. So that's yes, right. And do you, what's what's your general perspective? Like, do you agree with my assessment? Do you have anything to add there? Yes, I agree because I also saw that some ETFs are not available anymore to buy, only sell. And I don't actively use this broker anymore to buy ETFs, mainly for that reason because it's not stable. They are not stable regarding regarding the availability of their ETFs. So for me, that's a huge disadvantage for Saxo. Yeah, it's a shame because otherwise they're, you know, they're generally good. Okay. All right. Let's move to the next one. We've done four out of 10. So Rebel is, it's a broker by Belfius and it's actually really good. It's got everything that we want from a security perspective. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything again, but it's the same as Bolero. It's got all, all good. It's got everything we need from an access perspective. Again, the same as Bolero. It's got everything we need from a convenience perspective. Again, same as Bolero. And from a cost perspective, they're actually a bit cheaper than Bolero for AWDA and a bit more expensive for Frankfurt. So if you're trading in Amsterdam, Rebel is actually very cheap and very interesting compared to it's cheaper than Bolero. And if you're trading in Frankfurt, then it's a bit more expensive than Bolero. Not very much, no? Like we go from, well, actually, yeah, maybe 40% you know, more expensive. So yeah, it, actually it can be a bit more expensive. <laughs> but the key would be to basically pull amounts of 5,000 and then make transactions when you get to 5,000 with Frankfurt. That's the key to make the cost for your investment go down. So if you're investing large amounts on Frankfurt, that's good. And if you're investing small amounts, then it's quite good as well. So in Amsterdam. So Rebel, solid platform is not something that most, that it's not used by many in the community because it's quite new. I think it's about two years old, um, but I think it's a very solid alternative to what most of the community, what, what the community is using so far. What do you think? I have nothing to add. All right. Very, very so links. It's Dutch-based broker, also established in Belgium. They are set up as basically a front store for Interactive Broker, which is a very well-known international broker based in the US, but also with branches in Ireland, Luxembourg, etc. And so basically, Lynx provides access to Interactive Brokers. They provide good customer service and they deal with Belgian taxes. I don't know if they add if, they, if there's anything else that really adds value to the experience as index investor, basically to provide access to inter interactive brokers. Interactive brokers, which is a platform that's very well known internationally, but doesn't deal with any of the Belgian taxes. So Lynx does some of it, not all. And they are, it's, it's not user-friendly as a platform. I mean, it can be complicated and you kind of have to know your way around to actually be able to deal with what you have to do on interactive brokers because it's designed for traders. And so Lynx provide a nice interface for it. And, and customer support, et cetera. But they don't do all taxes, right? So they do the tax on transaction, which is the main one, but they don't do the tax on dividend distribution or the tax on bond ETF capital gains. And you still need to register your account with the National Bank of Belgium and declare it in your personal tax declaration. Am I right on all these links? On, on links yes, done? and it's all good. It's correct. Right. And then they're actually fairly cheap. They're, they are kind of in the middle of the pack and similar to Rebel, but cheaper for... Frankfurt. So generally, they're cheaper than Bolero and they are cheaper than Rebel for transactions on Frankfurt. So for example, VWC. So links, low costs, but you have to deal with taxes. Some, very rarely. And you have to register your account with National Bank of Belgium, right? So I would say this is something you might have to... So again, selling bonds with capital gains is something that happens very rarely. We pay very little taxes. Bonds are very important for those of you who are saying, well, why would I invest in bonds if the tax would capital gain there? Bonds are not there for 
profit, they're there for stability. And so the tax on capital gain is something that you pay very rarely because you very rarely sell bonds for rebalancing or anything else. And it's going to be a very small capital gain and it's a 30% of a small amount. So it's very rare. Anyway, when it happens, you need to make sure you actually pay it. But it's, it's rare and it's small. And it's just, I just want to highlight that because we didn't say it before. So Lynx, solid platform, just deal with taxes. And I think what else do we have here? Contact details, yes. Good responsiveness. They provide access to the usual things. We don't know if they have access, like company investment accounts. That wasn't, we couldn't clarify that. And the custodians are the custodians of interactive brokers. And this is the credit rating of interactive brokers themselves, Don? Yes. Indeed. Triple B plus, yeah? So this is still on the high side. It's just lower than the biggest institutions that we've seen so far. Obviously, Interactive Broker is a broker, not a bank. So they have a lower credit rating. But this is of IB. And I believe IB keeps the assets in other custodian banks as well. So it would be the higher rating. So this is probably something, if you do invest through links and you're curious about credit rating of custodians, I think there's more research to be done, right? Yeah. And then no payment for the flow, no kickback from product providers. And then, ah, oh, we didn't talk about the price of very large transactions. So it's very expensive with Rebel and it's decent with links. All right. That's it's fine. This is not a very big issue for most people. So we just move on. Amidirect is based in Belgium and they provide everything we need from a security perspective, except from the actual account security. It looks like it's text message and we couldn't confirm if there's options for two-step or two-factor system. Again, maybe they do provide it as an option, but we didn't actually open an account to test it. So we don't have full confirmation and we don't have information on security lending for them. They do provide access to everything we need, but we don't know if they have access to all ETFs because we are not certain of what ETFs they have available. But li most likely they have access to all ETFs that are, inter that are interesting. But again, I think with them, if you have specific ETFs you want to invest in, just I would check before opening an account. And the problem is they don't respond very well. So maybe you just open the account check and then close the account if they don't have DTF in <laughs> convenience. They deal with all taxes for Belgium. That's good. And in terms of costs, they're kind of done, they're on the middle ground as, as well, similar to, to Bolero. I don't know if we need to go into, they're just a little bit more expensive than Bolero for Amsterdam and at the same price as Bolero for Frankfurt. So they're kind of middle in the middle as well, mid direct. Yeah. Contact details provided, they didn't respond to us, so we say they have bad responsiveness during the research for brokers. They have individual and joint accounts and professional accounts, case by case. Do you know what that means, Tom? In documentation, so... Okay, so I guess it would I be think... a company or professional accounts for those who are professional traders, something like this, right? The custodians are in the name of Bidirect as nominee for its clients. So it's basically, they don't tell us who, who are the custodians and what the credit ratings are. We couldn't find information. I mean, Tony, we're doing the research. And we, we couldn't find information and they did not respond to a request for information. So we don't know. And again, payment for the flow and keep of providers. In most cases, that's not, no, most likely they don't. Uh, but again, they didn't respond. So they couldn't confirm or deny if it's the case or not. And then finally, they're fairly expensive for large transactions. It will be 400 euros. For, for ex fairly expensive compared to the others, but still generally cheap uh, to invest large sums through those platforms. So, so me direct sort of, okay, middle of the pack type broker, not very much used by the community, but they are kind of up there somewhere between Bolero and Keytrade, maybe from a price perspective and similar to Saxo Bank, maybe in terms of access to like security, uh, security of, of accounts, right? Yeah. Do you want to do ING? Okay. So ING, self-invest, takes the boxes for security. So Belgium based, so that's all good. No security lending. And then access parts, the access to the preferred ETFs. We didn't got confirmation that VWCE and IW, 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 IBWA is, is both possible. So please check in advance or please check if you open the account. For convenience, yeah. all good. So one thing I wanted to add in terms of access to preferred ETFs, and we should have mentioned this earlier, but basically here, when we say access to preferred ETFs, it's really, we kind of check if they have AWD and VWC because it's two main ETFs the community is using. But there's many people with whom we work, me and Ton, through the Index Investing Online course, who end up investing in ETFs that are not those two, either sustainable ETFs or lower cost ETFs or to choose other ETFs for other reasons. Actually, quite commonly, people don't invest in those two. And they, those ETFs are usually, because they're less common, not all platforms would have them, but certainly those who don't have both and VWCE are less likely to have them, right? So 
So I think it still reflects quite well the availability of those more like specific ETFs that we discuss in the course for those who are interested. But yeah, so I, I would say ING is unlikely to have most of the ETFs that we find really interesting after doing our deep research on ETFs as well. And uh, so that is reflected here as well with the score or the score with the color we gave them yellow. <laughs> right. Let's, let's continue. So for co convenience tax reporting, it's a, it's a Belgian bank. So it, it all, does it all. all yeah. good. And then cost, that's a, a big red flag because they are charging an ongoing fee and they advertise it's very little percentage per month, but we recalculated it per year and it's 0.29% per year with a minimum of €3.63 per line. So it's not a little, a little fee that they charge every, every yeah. month or, th or every year. I think here what's important is to compare this to the other ongoing fees that we are paying, which is the total expense ratio of ETFs. Yeah. And basically, you know, most ETFs are around 0 0.2, maximum 0.25% per year. And this is an ongoing fee that's higher than that. So it would make the total ongoing fee on your portfolio close to 0.5%, which is, and obviously this is an ongoing fee that will create a massive drag on our investments, as we all know. And so that is for us a big no-go, especially that we have a lot of other platforms that give us what we need. Okay, so just realizing how big it is, it's basically paying double the TR at least, no? If we if we invest through NG. They don't charge a lot of transaction fees, but as Sebastian said, the ongoing fee is, is a no-go. So they actually look cheap compared to the other brokers if you only look at transaction fees. But because of this ongoing fee, it completely, you know, it's it's it will be a big drag on investment returns long term. Yeah. Very good. Let's see of what what other notes we have. They were quite responsive. I think you were in touch with them. Yeah, and they responded quite, not immediately, but the day after via mail. So with yeah. very detailed information. Yeah, that's very good. They have the usual accounts and then they have something. Yeah, basically they didn't give us, no, they did give us their custodian, Euroclear Belgium, with a rating of double A for ETFs, right? And this is fine. And then payment for order flow, right? They don't do payment for order flow because they use their own oh. platform. Yeah, indeed. And kickback from product providers such as ETFs, distribution fee for providing non-independent investment advice. That's more for their own funds and for, for active managed funds, so not for the ETFs. But we, I would like to, to highlight it here that they make also money from other sources. But for us, ETF investors, it's not that important. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this would apply to actual ETFs, but certainly when they sell their own funds... There is a system of distributing, redistributing the fee to whoever actually signed it up and all of that, and which all banks do. No, they have entry fees, ongoing fees, and then that's how anyway the whole banking system works <laughs> through investing. That's why we don't invest through banks. So. We did include them because they looked interesting. Self invest when they first offered the, the, the services as a, as a broker, but the moment we saw the ongoing fee. Yeah, they're still on the list. Maybe we should remove them just because of that big red flag. But they're here for those of you who seem to be interested in their low cost transaction fees. Just make sure to also see that there is a very high ongoing fee. Right. So overall, ING, ING, good. We don't know if they provide access to everything we need and they're, ex well, and then they're expensive. But like if you don't mind paying, which you should, but if you don't mind paying, they're, they're probably a very good platform. You know, they're solid in terms of security and all that. Okay, let's go to Trade Republic. So Trade Republic is a fairly new broker available in Belgium. It's only since October of 2022 that they're available in Belgium. They've been around in Europe, especially Germany, where they were founded and they're growing fast as an investment platform. They have basically they're using innovative approaches to, to trade and to reach new customers. And they've they came to Belgium. The director for Belgium contacted me and Asked me if I was interested in promoting them when they were launching. Was asking for help, and I we had a good conversation. You know, very 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 nice person. And I think Trade Republic is an interesting broker because they're innovative in a certain way. They provide really interesting services, which can discuss. But they also have some major drawbacks for now. So anyway, I did not accept to promote them <laughs> because of those red flags in my book. But again, they could be a very interesting platform in the future. We'll see how this develops. But since it's still a beginning, I'm, I'm sort of observing. So let's let's go through through the details for them. So generally, from a security perspective, they're good. They're regulated in, the, in Germany and they have the usual good security and safety features. They provide access to the ETFs that we need. 
and there are adding ETFs. So I do know that at one point we discussed certain ETFs that I was interested in were not available on the platform Trade Republic, but they are now. So they are a growing entity and so they're adding ETFs. And I think that if some ETFs are not available they that you want to invest in, they will probably try and get them for you, which by the way, is also the case for most other brokers. So there's been many ETFs that I was interested in that I went and asked the broker to include them and they did, Bolero did. And I remember Saxo Bank did that back in the days when I was using them. So most brokers, if you ask for a specific ETF, they will try to find it for you and make it available. And so Triple Republic is just building its list of ETFs as well. Now on the convenience side, this is where that's their main weak point. They don't do any of the taxes for Belgian investors. If it wasn't for my understanding of the innovative side of things and some of the really benefits of Trade Republic, I would not include them in here because there's a bunch of brokers that are not listed here, mostly because they're not doing the tax on transaction. But I think Trade Republic, you know, deserves a special spot because they are doing certain things that are quite unique, which can discuss a bit further. One of which is actually having very low costs. So they don't have ongoing fees and there's no transaction costs for the automatic investment plans that they have. So they offer investors to invest once a month, a fixed amount on an automatic way, which is amazing because for a lot of people, that's what you want. No brain, a way of investing that costs nothing. Basically makes the savings account completely useless because hopefully long-term, usually long-term brings much better benefits, much higher benefits. But then it's one euro per transaction for non-automatic investing. So this is sort of aligned with the zero one euro handling fee, but it looks like they have also a way of investing for free if you invest monthly with them. And they have ways of managing this internally so that it doesn't cost them much to make those transactions because they pull the money when they make those transactions and then it's all dealt with in there properly. They also give, they give access to fractional shares, which we don't really need. For some people investing very small amounts and wanting to buy very expensive shares might be interesting. That's not our case because we're investing in index, index ETFs, but they do that. And so, yes, their fees are low. If you do the automatic monthly investing up to 10,000 euro per month, it will be free. And if you make transactions without the automatic investing plan, then you pay one euro transaction, which is tiny. I mean, it's irrelevant almost. So just like the zero, extremely cheap. I will continue. Ton, any comments on this so far? No comments. Contact these are here. Very good responsiveness. I mean, I had a very good conversation with the director for Belgium, Matthias. So Matthias, yes, Matthias. So uh, yeah, it's, I think they have very good connection, good, good communication, and he's very responsive, I think, on any issue people may have about the platform in Belgium. Custody, the custody banks are Solaris Bank, HSBC, Deutschland, Citibank, and Deutsche Bank. Solaris Bank, we don't have an actual credit rating for them, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if that's where the, all the money is held. But the other banks are solid banks with good credit ratings. And here we see Citibank actually A+. Plus. We could have, we could use it in the other broker. And then the innovation comes from the way they actually make money. That is through payment for order flow and kickback from product providers. I think mostly kickback from product providers. I don't remember the exact breakdown, but Matthias was telling me, and I think it was mostly from kickback from product providers. So this is how they manage to provide very low cost transactions is that they make money through other ways, right? So they have agreements with ETF issuers. So whether that's BlackRock or maybe Vanguard or some of the other ones, but they also provide access to ETF issuers or product providers, products for which they don't get kickback, right? So this, you know, it can be basically if the money comes from the product provider and the, it doesn't change the cost on that side of things, right? If, so the, if the TR isn't changed because of these kind of new deals, then the cost of the transaction is basically borne by the ETF provider, which could be interesting because they're just interested in just augmenting. They might be interested in paying for additional assets without changing their TR. That's great for us. But if it leads to an increase in TR, then we end up paying for it. So exactly, again, the, the incentives are kind of moving around and not exactly aligned. And then the payment for order flow, there was a study done uh, apparently independently by a university, I think in Denmark, that looked at the data from Trade Republic, that Trade Republic actually, I think it's a study that they commissioned, right? But it was done independently by an independent body to check where payment for order flow had a negative impact on the experience and the performance for individual investors. And the conclusion from that study was that no, it actually had positive impact because it was reducing, I think, the, the BDASK spread. And so people were getting actually better deals through trade publics as opposed to investing through other brokers that were not using the Hamburg Stock Exchange, right? So again, it's one paper, 
one instances and one set of data that was provided by Trade Republic. So there's, you know, we, we don't know exactly all the details, but there seems to be indication that they're providing, they have an innovative approach that allows them to provide better prices at zero transaction cost. That's what they claim. And, you know, I hope it's true and I hope they, they can continue doing that. But again, I don't know the details. And so I do think that they are promising because, because of that approach. I don't know if this mis, like, misalignment of incentives is going to be good or bad long term. I don't know. I quite like to pay for the service I'm getting and make sure that the service provider is focusing on making me happy. So that's the case for most brokers where we just pay for transaction. But I'm curious to see where Trade Republic is going to go. One thing that really does capture my attention is the monthly recurring plan where people simply put automatic investments on autopilot. And I think that's something that must be implemented for more by all the brokers one way or another i think that is the way to go for this and then obviously the main red flag for me is that they don't deal with taxes and they do provide a report that will help people actually fill in those taxes but i to me and you know if if those taxes were dealt with by true republic then certainly would be an interesting platform to use and according to matthias this is coming soon but you know it's a conversation we had in october i don't know how soon in the future this is coming but Hopefully the day the day they deal with all taxes and they do it properly and we're sort of confident in all that, they become a very interesting platform to explore, to keep an eye on it for sure. Right. So that's kind of where I am on, on Trade Republic. Again, Don, what do you think? Any any comments? The only point is the the taxes, uh taxes part. Very interesting when you can set it on autopilot and set and forget. So that's very interesting. Yes, yes. So that's that's really the piece of innovation that's that I was most interested in. All right, let's talk about Maxim. So Maxim, we start by showing what we don't like, which is, well, it's regulated in Cyprus and there's been issues in Cyprus before. So we don't really know what, you know, how much safety and security there is implemented there and enforced. But otherwise, it's a European-based broker. They're actually originally based where? You remember? It was it Netherlands? Yes, I think Netherlands. And they also have a kind of Belgian, not 100% sure, but Belgian branch, but... I think it's 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 from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't really have much experience with them. We included them because some invest, some people in the community invest through Maxim, but we don't have very much experience or full understanding. But here's our an overview. It looks like they have they provide access to most things we want, but maybe not all markets. So it's something to check with them. Was it Amsterdam or Frankfurt that may not have been available? We had this Good in question. The Cannot say it now. <laughs> it's fine. One of those two <laughs> seem to be unavailable. To be checked because again it might have been just at the time of checking and maybe maybe we got something wrong there i don't know but one big thing is obviously that they don't deal with all the small taxes they do deal with tob which is the big the big the big part of taxes but they don't deal with the other taxes so it's a bit like the zero you'd have to re register them with the national bank of Belgium, declare the tax on dividends and bond etf capital gains and pay those and then they're actually quite cheap Right, so Maxim is interesting and attractive to a lot of investors because of their fees, which are very low. 0.06% on transaction, with a minimum of 1.8 euro. I think there's some there's some brokers for which is like 6%. No, no, it's not. 0.6% would be the minimum. Oh, no, we had 6 euros. 0.06%. So it's lower than Lynx, basically, right? And Lynx was already one of the cheapest. So it's not as, as low as the Giro or Trade Republic, but it's the next one, right? So they're kind of like an order of of cheapness <laughs> they're the third cheapest and that's probably what has uh, attracted a lot of customers to them but you'll have to deal with with taxes and then they regulate in cyprus we don't really know what that means in terms of uh, our notes we have the contact details here responsiveness average remember why we said average because they answered some questions on the phone but didn't send confirmation oh, that's right email. yes we're not we were not especially impressed by their responses on the phone either. Okay. And then they are similarly to links. They are a front front store or an intermediate with interactive brokers, which means that they bring all the credibility of interactive brokers and, and hence also the custodians and all that. So similarly to links, they will deal with the tax on transaction. They will provide customer support, but then you use interactive brokers platform, right? So I would say the main added value there is tax on transaction, customer support for budget investors, so in Dutch and French and I guess in English. And then the fees are higher than if you were investing through interactive brokers, but lower than if you were investing through links. Right? So that's kind of where we are. And so probably no payment for the flow or kickback from product providers. 
But that would be something to check with the travel brokers to get the full details. But from as far as we understand, it's no. And again, they're very cheap for large transaction, 120. Right. Did I miss anything on Mexem or we've covered all things? We covered everything. Wow. Okay. All right. So we've covered all 10 brokers. <laughs> What's your general, like, how do you feel after doing this full review, Ton? Intensive research, a lot of, a lot of reading and, and calling, like I said at the beginning, but I learned a lot. That's also very important to, to keep on learning. So uh, yes, it's a nice overview, 10 brokers. So uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think we covered the 10, 10 main ones that really have high potential for Belgium, including one that doesn't deal with tax and transaction, which we made an, ex an exception for, but all of the other ones they do. And that was, that's, that is quite important. Yeah. And I think we, we know what this is a lot of information gathered and collected in one place, organized and summarized. I mean, we've put all our knowledge in here, our experience of index investors, me 10 years and you four years of investing. And yeah, I, I guess for people who don't know much about index investing, this could look overwhelming. Now, this table and summary and this podcast and the article that will come along in the file will be useful. But if you are completely new to index investing, this might be confusing too. I mean, it will tell you which broker to use, but maybe not how to and how to build your portfolio and what to understand about taxes. We've highlighted the main taxes that we want the broker to deal with, but you know, maybe you want to understand exactly how they work and how to optimize for those. And so for anyone listening and who... Maybe now it's like, oh, wow, that was a lot of information, but it's confusing. Then, you know, we recommend that, and I recommend that you check the free workshop. So basically I have designed a workshop where I explain the basics of index investing and how to get started, which starts from much more basic level, right? So this is very quite advanced already, um, but then the basics are there. And then we also show you how you can learn more, including with free resources and the access to the index investing online course, which is the main resource for which we are actually developing this content, right? So this content here is part of the Index Investing Online course. In the course, this is available, plus a lot more, a lot more guidance on how to, to deal with this, how to actually manage those brokers, how to select the correct broker for you. So this is one set of criteria, but there are other things that you want, you might want to consider. If you are an expat, if you're moving, if you, there's something you like, something you don't like, if you already have accounts here or there, etc. There's a bunch of things that you might want to consider. And then how to actually select your portfolio, deal with taxes, build your portfolio, find it, actually do the transactions and just be a good investor long-term. So all of those details we cover in great details, again, in the Index Investing Online course. We talk about it at the end of the free workshop. So if you're interested in that, the workshop is still the place to go to first because then you get the full overview of what's available in the Index Investing Online course. But that certainly is where we've made, you know, we've helped the most people. I think we are more, we have more than 250 people who have taken the course so far. 13 of them in Dutch, right, Tun? <laughs> Was it 13? Yeah. yeah, I think you had 13 students. And we're working on the next version of the course, which is going to include all of these brokers here, but also with a lot more guidance for people who just want to get started and move you know, step by step, practically actually select their one or two ETFs they need, put the of the broker in place and actually start investing in the simplest and most effective way that we know. So that's that's the index investing online course. Again, you'll find it if you watch the free workshop on the website and then it will link it to you. The free workshop has a ton of information too. So even if you don't want the course, you can learn a lot from there. These are the main resources we have for you. And then otherwise, feel free to ask questions in the Facebook group around this. Feel free to share this podcast. Feel free to share the article because they like this is a ton of information that we haven't found anywhere else in you know presented in this way and with all this research behind. So feel free to share it. It's available for anyone to benefit from. And we just want people to invest better. And the broker is clearly something that's important. It's the platform. Uh, but don't forget, it's only... The intermediary, right? But really matters is what you're investing in and how you invest and how you manage your emo the emotional aspects, the mindset aspect as well. So it's technical mindset. And then this is just the, the intermediary for the actual transactional aspect of things. And one more thing before we go into the final section of this podcast, which is our favorite brokers and why, which you might have an idea already of. If you pick a broker and you start investing with one, it's not like you're getting married to the broker. Even today, marriage doesn't mean that as much as it used to, but basically you can change brokers, right? So big news, if you don't like your broker, if you find that after reading this article or listening to this podcast, you're not really happy with your broker and you want to see if there's other options, open an account with them, test the broker. And if you feel comfortable, simply transfer your investments there. It's not complicated. It's just, to, you know, just contact the brokers and tell them you want to do that. They'll help you 
they'll help you out. Sometimes it's a small fee. Sometimes it's reimbursed by the new broker you're moving to. But basically, moving broker is not a big deal. I've done it several times and I'll do it again in the future and it's okay. So do that. But yeah, make sure you know what you're doing in terms of investing. And so that's why we're here if you need help. All right. So now, so let's move to the final section of this episode. Our favorite brokers and why. Tony, you start. Okay. I have three brokers that are for me, I would call it the, the most interesting or the best one for me. The first one is Bolero. Bolero, very secure broker, has a big bank behind like IBC in, in Belgium, handles all the taxes. So that's no worries about taxes because it's all handled by the by Bolero and not that expensive. So in the middle ground, but you pay for what you get. As also an, a nice platform, not that difficult. So it was not difficult to start investing with, with Bolero. Second one is Keytrade. Keytrade uh, has a decent platform, is also based in Belgium. So uh, all taxes are also handled. And for me, I only use it when I, when I invest larger amounts. So because the main reason is the, is the cost part. And then the third broker is the Giro. I invest already for some time in, in the Giro mainly for the kids, the amounts that we invest for them in ETFs are, are smaller than the amounts that we invest ourselves. But we still use the Giro because it's cheap when you invest with smaller amounts. That's Amazing. it for me. All right. And so you have you actually have accounts with all three of those, right? I have accounts with all three of those. All three of those. And indeed, like I already said, I also have a Saxo bank account. And it's also easy for, for research for this list. But indeed, I have four accounts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do agree with your assessment for for those brokers. I'm okay. I don't know if I would have a top three <laughs> that will say which ones I like. I might not be able to limit myself to three. I do like Bolero a lot. Yes, again, safety first, security first, and they seem to be super safe and solid. I like everything about them: the convenience, the platform, the customer service, and the fees. I, I like them, yeah, honestly, because it's cheap. That's the truth. It's not the cheapest, but it's cheap compared to, you know, if you were investing through any any other kind of thing <laughs> that an online broker, like all of those. So basically all of the platforms that we listed here are cheap. And Bolero just happens to be also cheap, plus good in all other aspects. And that's why I do like it a lot. Very responsive. They've added ETS fast when I was asking for them. Yeah, generally very happy. And a lot of people who took the course are very happy with Bolero. The Giro. Great place to start with very small amounts, like you said, Ton, I think. Basically, if you're not too worried that, like, we've highlighted a few issues with Digital, right? Which kind of can be annoying. But if you're investing small amounts and it's a small part of your portfolio because you're investing in some, I don't know, real estate in large amounts and then you have a small thing, I think Digital is a decent place to start. It used to be better because it was free transactions for the core selection. So I think if you were investing 50 or 100 euro a month, this was a no-brainer. I think it still is for one euro is still fine, but you would just want to invest slightly bigger amounts, I guess, to maintain some kind of like happy, happy trade cost, low cost. Key trade good for large transactions. So someone who's saying I have 500,000 euros to invest and I don't mind putting it all in once because it's only a small part of my assets and I understand the long-term game. The key trade is cheap, but Saxo Bank is cheap too. So I think either of those would be okay. And Saxo has this security issue so i wouldn't put that, that there but i wouldn't say key trade is a favorite i would just say it's like this is one use another use would be the kids accounts like these are the two two cases where i would say key trade maybe and then if you're really freaked out about security the fact that there's a seventy thousand euro state guarantee maybe maybe but i don't think that's a good reason to open an account specifically for key trade i do like rebel because there are basically the bolero with slightly different fees they're a bit cheaper for Amsterdam and a bit more expensive for Frankfurt. So if you're trading in Amsterdam and you're certain that's where you want to invest and trade and the ETFs are there, then Verbal is a direct alternative to Bolero, slightly cheaper. To me, I would open an account in both and see which one I like most in terms of actual, like how things go, right? I wouldn't use the app, the phone app, but I would use the, the computer and see how it is and have a chat with the customer service and see how, see how I feel and then pick the one that I feel the most comfortable with because price-wise they're very similar slightly cheaper on rebel but otherwise to me they're both kind of like on equal footing and maybe if on frankfurt it's a bit expensive but it's again not very much expensive right as we said 40 percent more links and mexem they are solid with ib but they don't do with taxes just like the zero that's annoying me right so with the zero it's annoying me with links and mexem it's annoying me but i would say if you want low cost and you are a bit worried about the zero 
but you still don't want to deal with tax and transaction, then links and XM are good alternatives because they're the, the same as the Giro basically without the security, like, well, links mostly without the security concerns potentially because MXM is Cyprus, so not my favorite. But I say links is, is a decent platform from that perspective, from based on what we've looked at. It's, I would say, to me, it's a bit better than the Giro because, because we have fewer security concerns and it requires the same amount of work from a tax perspective. It's still very cheap. Not as cheap though. So that's maybe one thing. Me direct, I don't really have anything against me direct. So it's just there a bit like Saxo. Kind of not, I'm not sure how to security wise the, the council has something to be checked. IND no thanks, entry republic. Not now. That's kind of where I am. But I would say if I have to speak up top three, I would go Bolero, Belfius. I don't know if I would go for Lynx or Trade Republic. Right. So that's maybe the where where I am now. And Trade Republic. Yeah, we've highlighted what we like about them, right? So monthly investment plan to me is the key feature that makes them special. I wouldn't mind paying the same price as I have with Bolero or lower, whatever, to have this monthly investment plan available. Now, what makes it interesting is that it's free. So it's very good for low investment amounts for people who don't have much, but just want to automate something. So that's great. It's just that tax wise, this needs to be dealt with. And so... I'm waiting for them to actually f do it properly for all Belgian investors. And when that's the case, then I'll be happy to explore again. But in the meantime, I do not recommend them because tax managing those taxes is a real, can be a challenge. And I, I always, my position is that I want to find a solution that works for most people in Belgium that takes the least work and that doesn't lead to any kind of trouble, include potential penalties here, re reduce work. So I don't want people to have to deal with taxes because it might be complicated. Even if the calculation is fairly, it could, can be simple or simplified or facilitated. It's still much easier when it's the broker doing it because you don't even have to think about it. And it's a mental weight that just gets dropped. So the day trip will this with this. That's a big game changer to me. I do not know about the impact of payment for the flow and the kickback from retail providers, but I'm curious to see where that's going. And it's something that you can check when you buy on Trade Republic at a certain price, you could check at the same time how much it is on Bolero. And if there's a massive difference, you say, well, there you go. There's an impact. But if there isn't, then, you know, it's to be seen. So I'm curious. So basically they, they did attract my attention and I wanted to see where they're going. Other brokers could take the good innovation from them. For example, the monthly automated contribution to the investment plan. I like that. I think other brokers could implement it. And if that was the case, I would be very happy to support that as well. Even if it's not free, I don't mind like the price of thing. To me, paying a little bit of money for a good platform, good transaction and convenience, this monthly investment plan is high, high, high convenience, probably the highest point of convenience. I, I don't mind paying for it. So there you go. That's kind of my, sorry, that was not top three at all. It's a massive review of the whole thing. <laughs> sorry, Tona, I give you like constraints and then you fit, you stick to them, well done. And then I just go off completely off rail. But yeah, if, if you agree or disagree on any of these points, I'm interested to hear. I agree on your feedback. It's not the same top three, but I agree. But it's, it's just a nice, it's a nice overview of the advantages and disadvantages of each broker. So uh, yeah, totally agree on your feedback. Cool. So we're going to post this on the website. It's going to be available in video podcast, audio podcast as an article, and the file will be downloadable somewhere. We have to figure this out. Everyone, if you've, if you've listened to this, or if you watch this and you find it useful, please, you know, share with people, let us know if you find this useful. Cause we really, you know, we thrive on people's feedback, telling us if something was useful, because that's what gives us the most satisfaction, but please share, you know, comment. If it's a video, leave us a review on the podcasting app that you are using. Send us a thank you note. If you find this useful, it's a, it's a ton of work. And so any, any message of appreciation, you know, will be very welcome <laughs> and highly appreciated. So I would say these are, these are my, my asks in return. We provide this information for free. It's not available anywhere else. And we do that because we want it to be good for everyone and everyone to have the best investment experience and returns and all of that possible. That's why Fire Belgium exists. I'm not even doing it to get rich because I don't pay myself. <laughs> there is an online 
course that is paid, but it's, it's used to actually pay for support resources, people like Ton, people, and other people who are helping behind, behind the curtains and to donate to charity. So that's what Fire Belgium does. I might pay myself at some point in the future. I don't have to, but I might because time has value and my work has value. But for now, I just want to help as many people as possible. And Ton has been super instrumental in delivering this piece here. So send him also special notes of appreciation. If you know him or if you don't know him, thank him, connect with him, follow him on social media. He's just getting started on LinkedIn. Connect with us everywhere. We are actually on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and soon on TikTok. Anyway, so yeah, I hope we... I think both hope that you appreciate the work we've done here, that you learned a lot, that you're going to use this wisely for simple and effective index investing long-term in a balanced portfolio of stocks and bond index funds to the level of risk that you can actually manage <laughs> without caring about the short-term news and all the jazz that is basically useless to us because we only care about what happens in, to our money in the very long term. It doesn't matter what happens short term. That you are prepared for a market crash because it could happen at any point. And as index investors, we simply like to be prepared all the time. And what else? That you use money as a tool to be happy and to live a good life. And that all this knowledge will help you do that. That's the key. Learn to take control of your finances so that you can be more, live more, and give more. Right. Anything else to add, Tom? No. Not right. Bad. Then that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. And see you at the next episode. We look forward to your feedback and your connection and your shares and likes and all of that. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.